Okay, thank you for inviting me and for setting up the scene. Uh, I now have to perform the Prophet of Doom uh, kind of scenario. Uh, I, I'm not sure I can do that very well, but uh, there are translators and I was told I speak fast, which is true. I do speak fast, I get excited and then I do. Uh, if that happens, please stop me. I'm used to my students stopping me when I go very fast. Also, you can wave at the back uh, and I will try to go slower. Uh, and we'll see how long it takes. Um, if there are any questions, please stop me while I speak. I think I, I don't mind. Uh, it, will, it, it will be easier this way, probably. So I want to talk to you today about the emerging sort of solutions uh, on, on a global level, and I will touch on Germany as well, um, to, to the climate crisis. Uh, and I call these emerging solutions uh, 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 that are sort of gaining political um, sort of impetus and, and political uh, purchase, I call it the, the Wall Street consensus. But just to start by reminding ourselves why we are here and, and why we are worried, and I have to make a confession, uh, before I looked at this graph last, uh, until last year, I think, I was somebody who thought uh, the climate crisis or the climate change agenda is important, but it's not something that needs to be urgently addressed and put at the center of everything that we do. Uh, and then uh, I had a conversion um, in some way or another, if you want to call it. I don't know how many of you in this room are converted to and, and are uh, strong believers in the idea that we live in a, in a climate crisis. If I look at this graph, uh, I think it's very difficult for me to uh, construct a narrative where we shouldn't be worried, right? So what this graph is telling us is how the carbon dioxide concentration in atmosphere has evolved over the past 400,000 years, right? Uh, so if you see the, the historical CO2 levels sort of move up and down up to 300 um, um, uh, parts per, uh, CO2 parts per million, and then for the last 50 to 60 years, that number is shooting up very rapidly towards 400. And what this graph tells me one way or another is that this is very serious. In other words, we are moving towards an unprecedented uh, climate crisis and it's, it's easy to see it in the numbers. And there is a sense of urgency, I think, uh, and we have seen this uh, uh, sense of urgency for, from the climate protests, uh, I think this was some, sometimes in September, where we've seen a global mobilization for, for climate change, and uh, we had a, glo uh, a global climate strike uh, all over the world. People mobilized, in, in part uh, sort of energized by the, the energy of, of young people who are going into the streets every Friday and protesting, I think rightly so, because I'm, I'm now 40, I don't have so much left, but if I was 15, I, was, I would be very worried about what, what is going to happen to me in, in 40 to 50 years time. And we can see the sense of urgency not only on the streets, but we start to see it in policy discourse. Uh, this for those of you who uh, have followed the IMF and the World Bank. This is Christine Lagarde. She used to be the, the head of the IMF until very recently, and she's now taken over at the ECB. She's replacing Mario Draghi. And the first major sort of shift or promise that she has made uh, to fulfill as the head of the uh, ECB was to paint the ECB green. In other words, to green the ECB. Now we'll talk a little bit of why this is a very radical proposal in, in many ways. What it will mean in practice is a very open question, but for a central bank to say we are in a climate crisis and we think it is part of our mandate to deal with the climate crisis is, is quite a big step. So we have this, then we have the new European Commission, which is going to take over very soon, and Franz Timmermans uh, here in a tweet, I am a great admirer and user of Twitter, uh, I get all my news all from there. Uh, there is the, the new European Commission has come in or will come in with a, a promise to uh, create an ambitious Green New Deal for Europe, which will ensure the health, prosperity and security on a green and thriving planet. Very heartwarming words in some ways. And not the kind of stories that you hear very often from the European Commission, but this is the promise that we are hearing now. The institutions, 
that are in charge of our uh, uh, sort of Eurozone economy are starting to work together. And this is in many ways quite uh, unprecedented in order to, to, to green the uh, European financial system and in order to green the economy. And let's see. And this is makes Europe in many ways a sort of pioneer. We are at the avant-garde of the greening agenda. Uh, this doesn't. This is from a, a political headline, uh, and this somehow suggests that the U.S. is looking with some envy at the Europeans uh, because we didn't do very well in the financial globalization age. The eurozone crisis that we had in 2008 and the, the aftermath of the eurozone crisis has left the euro area much more debilitated than, than it has uh, left the US for a variety of reasons. So we didn't do very well with our political system during the age of financial globalization that started in the 1970s and ended up in a very significant crisis in 2008. But somehow it seems that we will be the leaders of the green age. If there is a green age coming, if we are taking seriously the political promises to green uh, economies all over the world to ensure a transition to a low carbon economy, and this is the kind of uh, sort of policy ambitions that we have in Germany. I think it's called the uh, Green Zero or uh, Grüne Null, right? My, my German is very rusty. Uh, this is, Europe is at the, at the forefront of that. Okay. So the question that uh, economists like myself, I am a macroeconomist that also does finance, is, okay, so once you have ambitions, that's great, <laughs> but how do you put them into practice, and what kind of policies do you design in order to ensure a transition to a low-carbon economy? And I think there are two different ways, or two policy paradigms, or, or global paradigms that are emerging, and one is to say, well, we have an ally that can help us through the, the climate crisis, that can guide us in the transition to net zero, and that is private finance, right? And I call this narrative the Wall Street consensus, and this narrative says you can maximize private finance for the environment. And I'll, I'll try to convince you that this is a pretty powerful narrative, and it's kind of slowly taking over uh, the World Bank, the IMF, and various institutions in the, in the, Euro, in the European Union. There is an alternative a solution that is coming from I mean, a variety of places, but it was popularized mostly in the US with Alessandro Castro Cortes. Now it's moving towards the U it, it moving in the UK. We have seen it also in, in some of the uh, statements of the European Commission, and that is a Green New Deal. And at, at its origins, the Green New Deal, New, New Deal is a fundamental rethinking of the way in which you organize the economy and the relationship between the state and private markets. And it's a return to the Keynesian era where the state takes a much more significant role in ensuring the allocation and reallocation of resources and of capital away from high carbon activities into low carbon activities. Okay, so these are two sort of very different political paradigms of how to deal with the climate crisis. And I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about the, the, the more sort of politically possible paradigm, which is the Wall Street consensus that says we have private finance, we should uh, uh, use them as allies in order to, to fight uh, the climate crisis, and to argue that it's very different than the Green New Deal. And I want to start with a video of the World Bank that kind of puts into a very simple way how this Wall Street consensus, this logic of maximizing private finance for sustainable development and for the environment looks like. Let's see if I can make it work. Okay, work with me here. Ending extreme poverty worldwide will take some $4 trillion a year. Development aid is only 330 million. Another one trillion comes from remittances, philanthropy, and some other sources. So we're short, about three trillion a year short. Seems like a really big problem. Developing countries are a $12 trillion market opportunity. Opportunities in everything, actually. Hey, challenge, just found your opportunity. So besides investors, who would it help? These people, to live a healthy life. This man, 
and getting a good income. Or give this woman a chance to create something incredible. And everyone else in developing and developed countries alike. It's not just about getting private sector money into development. It's a process about when to use it, when to use public money, insurance, guarantees, or some combination that best fits. Not to replace development aid, but complement it. The World Bank Group and other development banks have the expertise to help private finance tap into developing markets, not just to invest in infrastructure projects, but in people. We call it maximizing finance for development. A little wonky, we know. And while developing countries are doing their part, it's just not going to be enough. That's why we need to rethink financing development. So this little one has a healthy life. And this woman can disrupt an industry with her product idea. And this youth, her big idea can change the world. In the end, we get strong markets and strong communities. And all of us get a world of opportunities. To learn more, check us out online. Okay. Uh, besides the slightly annoying American accent, uh, I think <laughs> there is... I, what, what is uh, interesting to, for me here is that there is a, a promise of sort of a new social contract between institutional investors and, uh, and, and private finance in general and uh, everybody else. And somehow together, collectively, we will solve the, the climate crisis. This is a video from 2017 uh, uh, produced by the World Bank Group. Uh, the World Bank has two main priorities uh, or two main, two main strategic areas. One is human capital and the other one is maximizing uh, finance for development. And it's, it's a logic of doing development interventions uh, in order to maximize private finance for development in, in poor countries. But it is a logic I will try to show you here that is also applying to high income countries. Okay. So when I think about the Wall Street consensus, and I, I want to call this the Wall Street consensus instead of maximizing private, uh, ma maximizing finance for development, because I think it is a sort of a paradigm shift uh, that has some continuities from the Washington consensus age in international development. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the, world, with the Washington consensus agenda, but it was an agenda of pushing the state out of the economy and creating the conditions for private markets to work by liberalizing uh, the economy, liberalizing the labor market, liberalizing product markets, privatizing state-owned companies, uh, and uh, uh, stabilizing the economy by having an independent central bank and a very small state in terms of the fiscal resources that it spends uh, in the economy. Now, the, what, what does the Wall Street consensus look like in very simple terms, right? I'm, I'm not going into the complicated uh, issues, but there is a paper uh, that Matthew referred to. It sort of dissects this into a much uh, more detail. But there is this logic that we have institutional investors, and I'll talk in a second about who are these institutional investors, but they are sitting on trillions of US dollars, and they are looking for sustainable investments. They are looking for new types of assets that are more friendly towards uh, development in general and uh, the environment in particular. So if we manage to leverage private finance, we can live and propose serious policies for climate change. Okay? How do we know and how do institutional investors know which are sustainable investments? Or how do you work out whether your portfolio of loans and bonds is sustainable or not? There is a new way of thinking what is sustainable. There are some new metrics that are relatively new metrics that are emerging. Some are produced by private corporations and uh, they are sort of generally described as ESG ratings, that is a system of rating companies first, and now you can also rate countries, on their environmental, social, and governance uh, uh, performance. And you create some ratings that tell you whether Tesla is doing very well on its ESG behavior or it is doing very bad. And if Tesla is doing very good, you should have it in your portfolio, and you can call this a sustainable investment in Tesla equities, for example. There is also a public taxonomy that is being developed by the European Commission, 
And I will talk a little bit about how the politics of the climate change agenda on a sort of a day-to-day -day basis in part have to do with the fight between who decides what is sustainable, who decides what is green. And when I talk about green assets or green financial products, we generally understand this to be financial products that are financing activities that have a low carbon footprint as opposed to brown, right? So green, brown. Brown are investments that are going into fossil fuel companies, for example. If you hold equities of Shell, that in theory, although not always in practice, would mean that you, ha you hold a brown asset. So the Wall Street consensus says we have the trillions, we have a system, a framework that can tell us where uh, these investments are green, where these investments are not exactly green or not exactly um, sustainable. And then the next step is to create the market conditions for these sustainable products to grow very quickly. In other words, we need to make sure that uh, uh, institutional investors who have the particular mandates of where they are allowed to invest or not can go there and we will subsidize one way or another. And I'll talk a bit about the way in which the state will subsidize green uh, finance. Uh, very important, we subsidize green, but we do not penalize brown. And that's another very big debate of how, yes. Hello, <laughs> the, I'm going to go slower. <laughs> that's a very, very big debate on how, uh, on, on what is the right balance between penalizing the fossil fuel investments and rewarding the uh, investments in, I don't know, solar panels or renewable energies. Okay, there is a, a sort of final measure that is very important, and that is uh, what does the state through its fiscal policy do? And the fiscal measures that are envisaged in the Wall Street consensus have to do with carbon pricing. That, that is the idea that if you change the prices or if you introduce incentives for uh, high carbon emitting activities to become more expensive, you increase carbon prices in a steep but not disruptive way, and you already can hear the steep and not disruptive uh, becoming very complicated in, in practical terms, then everything will be fine, right? So I think for me, these are the, the important plans, the important components of the Wall Street consensus. Uh, find the people with the money, define what is green and what is brown, promote green, and also bring in carbon prices. Um, one question about like, you say like you don't penalize brown, but would not exactly carbon price be exactly this, that you penalize brown activity. I mean, if you invest in fossil fuels, then you face a carbon price, then your uh, profit's going to be high, right? Hmm. So the, the, the way the sustainability part of, of the, or, or the taxonomy for guiding institutional investors has to, to do with how do you rank the financial products that you hold in your portfolio? which in a sense, which is different, but not completely different from having a carbon price. You have a carbon price, for example, like Germany did on, I don't know, um, houses that are, are not very uh, well uh, insulated. So the carbon price goes to the particular activity, whereas the, the taxonomy goes into identifying green and brown financial products, right? So for example, a, a corporate bond issued by Shell would be brown, regardless of what is the price of carbon, right? This is independent. The, the level of the, price, the, of the carbon price doesn't matter that much. Yeah, it makes sense? I will come back to this and discuss in a bit more detail the, the rating system. And Germany's new climate plan, uh, I am not completely familiar with it, but I've looked a little bit into it. I'm happy for you to correct me if some of these things are wrong, but I have a sense that the Germany's new, carbon, uh, uh, new climate plan is going into this uh, Wall Street consensus logic that says, well, we'll put a price on carbon that will increase gradually up to, up to 2030, uh, and we will make sure that um, um, we do not actually put any fiscal resources into greening the German economy, but with the taxes that we're getting from carbon prices, we will redirect them to uh, uh, green our economy. So no fiscal measures, all uh, through um, carbon pricing. And I think in some ways this has managed to upset the, the German new climate plan has managed to upset about everybody, which is maybe a good measure, but I'm not sure a very good measure of, of, of public policies. The, the environmental movement in Germany, as I understand it, uh, has de deemed this to be 
a uh, very unambitious plan that will not meet the uh, 1.5 uh, 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 Celsius degrees warming uh, target. Where it, when it also upset German farmers who are going to be at the receiving end of the carbon pricing uh, agenda without uh, uh, much uh, support from, from the German government. Okay, so I would argue that Germany's new climate plan is part of this story, uh, but I'm happy to, to discuss this in the break. Okay, so going back, taking a step back into thinking of, okay, so who are and how do we think through some of the the particular aspects and the particular elements of the Washington of the Wall Street consensus. I want to start by thinking of who are these institutional investors and why do they why have they become so important to our climate change agenda, right? It's not uh, they are not particularly famous worldwide. I'm hoping to make them more famous in, in, with my talks. Uh, they are when I, we talk about institutional investors, typically they have become very important in, in global policy discourse because they have lots of money. And that is literally the case. There are estimates that by 2025, they will be sitting on 145 trillion US dollars. And what they do with their trillions, whether they put them into brown activities or into green activities, will matter a lot for our progress towards net zero uh, uh, carbon emissions by 2030 or 2050 or 2070, whenever you want it to be. Uh, why have they grown so rapidly? Uh, there is an argument in the literature on um, the welfare state that institutional investors and their asset managers have grown very rapidly because we are shrinking the welfare state. They are the opposite sort of, uh, of, of the welfare state because institutional investors are made out of, and here I have an example for, for Germany, so we have a sense. Institutional investors are pension funds, public and private. They are insurance companies. They are sovereign wealth funds. They are the treasury operations of multinational corporations or large companies that have lots of cash that they are sitting on and they need to put it somewhere. And you see for, for Germany, uh, assets under management by, I found one, uh, one estimation, is around 1.2 trillion, right? So this is we're talking about uh, institutional investor uh, um, uh, availability in Germany. And there are several, I mean, there is a long list of who, are this, uh, who, are, who is managing these German institutional assets. Um, you will see union investment that I understand has to do with the uh, cooperative banks, Generali, Deca Bank, Deutsche Asset Management. Towards the bottom, you have BlackRock. It's very interesting that BlackRock is not ranking so high in Germany. BlackRock is the largest asset manager in the world. It collectively manages around 7 trillion US dollars, which is very significant. It's the combined uh, economies of, of uh, the combined GDP of Germany and, and France uh, and, and in the entire Eastern European uh, area in 2017. So this is the logic that we have these institutional investors. They are large in Germany. Uh, they are mostly domestic. Uh, and if we can reorient their financial investments away from brown into green, then we can make sure that the cost of capital for green activities uh, will, will uh, uh, reduce. And then we will get a transition to a low carbon economy uh, uh, that we need without a lot of interfer interference from uh, the state. Now, how do you get these institutional investors to go into uh, or to, to work out where they should be investing? In other words, what are the rules of the game for the climate change agenda in this logic of leveraging private finance? And that the, the rules of the game in, in the first instance are debated around what is green. In other words, how do we define what are green assets, what are green investments? And there are two ways to do that, and I've already mentioned it. I would spend a bit more time thinking about it. The ESG framework, the envi environmental, social, and governance uh, ratings, and there is a public one that is being debated now, the EU taxonomy. Okay. So let me just give you a sense of how important this is. Uh, this is the, the Deutsche Bank uh, asset management arm is arguing that we are looking at a tsunami of sustainable investment activity ahead. In other words, there is an expectation that everybody will be doing ESG or will incorporate the logic of ESG investment in their portfolios in the very uh, near term. Uh, and here the quote says, I think our investment procedures are going to change dramatically. 
uh, and the ESG as an investment principle would roll towards asset managers like a tsunami. Those who are not prepared will miss this trend. I think there is a lot more going on than those who are not prepared, but it's very important to bear in mind that in the, in the space of institutional investment, the question of green and the question of ESG is something that is being discussed a lot and something that is on uh, everybody's agenda. And my theory why this is the case is because there is a sense that the state will not sit on the side and wait for, for private finance to decide to go into green or to stay into brown. So if there are new rules of the game, private fi finance wants to be at the table at least negotiating, if not entirely deciding what are the new rules of the game. So there is this framework of, the, of sort of working out ESG. And then typically, a country will come up with a sustainable finance strategy. Okay, and I'm going to show you what I call a deregulated decarbonization strategy, which is let the market do the thing rather than us as a government do it. And this is the UK green finance strategy. This is the British government under uh, Theresa May has published this in June 2019. And it show, what it shows you here, let's see how much you can see. It has three planks, right? And they're very important because the emerging green finance strategy in Germany is very similar to this. So I want to discuss, it's not as well articulated. Actually, it's quite funny when you read it. I had some, uh, I, I amused myself last night uh, reading through that. But this is a, a, a way to think about how do you green the financial system in order to leverage it for a, um, greening the economy. So the UK green finance strategy has three planks, right? It says you have to green finance, that is to reorient private capital uh, towards green activities. You have to finance green activities, right? And these are not entirely the same thing. Uh, in, and in other words, you have to mobilize private finance for clean and resilient growth. And then the third plank is capturing the opportunity. And this is, you know, the, the city in London thinking about becoming an international center or becoming more competitive as a provider of a green finance instrument. So this, for, for, the, for the UK government, the climate crisis is a strategic opportunity to attract more business into the city of London. And this you will uh, sort of appreciate the importance of this because of Brexit and the idea of uh, might, we might we lose some uh, competitive edge because of our separation from the European Union. And what is interesting about the UK green finance strategy, besides having very nice uh, graphs, is that it's based on the ESG rating uh, system. It says very clearly that if we have taxonomies that we will apply, if we have sort of ways of measuring green and brown, it will be ESG. And the Bank of England might also ask for a voluntary disclosure of climate risk. That's another framework, but it's voluntary uh, and it captures the possibilities of a, of a financial crisis that come from uh, exposure to high carbon assets. There are some carrots for greening the, the mortgage market, but as incentives, this, we are not talking about subsidies to uh, solar panels uh, or, or, or state subsidies to, to, to solar panels for houses, but somehow to incorporate some green logic into mortgage lending by, by banks. Okay? And I would argue that this is a, a sort of greenwashing to a certain extent of the climate agenda because it doesn't uh, envisage a very strong intervention from the state in trying to realign finance. It says, if we just give the right nudges one way or another, private finance will find its way and it's fine. We will meet our 2050 net uh, uh, zero carbon uh, in doing so. So I would call this a deregulated decarbonization agenda. Whether it's successful or not, I have a very strong doubts, but this is what for the moment is the official uh, strategy for greening uh, the uh, finance and therefore greening the economy of the British government. And there is a version of this, but it's much less elabor elaborated, I think, because Germany has come a bit later to the, to the table or to, to thinking about how to green finance. And it starts with this. Uh, I have tried to find some sense into this uh, table. It says we need system analysis to have action fields you need to be relevant and you need to accept the need for change. Um, and you will provide recommendations and implementation plans. So it's very vague. It is, uh, I have not seen anything this vague. I'm thinking maybe it's the translation in English and they couldn't be bothered. <laughs> uh, but this is how at least the, the sort of advisory committee to the, to the German government, there is a, 
looks or thinks through what is necessary to do in order to green uh, the German financial system. And what is interesting, and so if you read through the documents and not only look at the, uh, at the very nice graphs, there is first a, a sense that, or there is an aspiration to establish Germany as a leading location for sustainable finance, which is quite similar to the British strategy of making the city a competitive uh, force in the uh, green finance agendas globally. Okay? And th that's one thing, and the other one is ESG is in here as well. So not, no talking about public taxonomies, it, it says, uh, you have to have systemic considerations of sustainability parameters, uh, yes. Uh, you have to apply scenario analysis and you have to do ESG stress tests and ESG scenario analysis, right? So it, it, is, it shares with the British uh, green finance strategy this trust in financial markets to do the right thing uh, uh, in terms of the climate crisis. Uh, and at the same time provide competitiveness to the, Brit to the German financial system. Okay. Now, why is ESG problematic? And I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about what is this ESG and why does it matter? It's, it's technical, but remember this is in some ways neoliberalism and, and the political is in the technicalities and we have to understand the technicalities in order to be able to fight it. Uh, so we know that the, more and more institutional investors are moving towards ESG investing and they do so by coming up with a metric, a system of evaluating and putting a number on the, the environmental, social, and governance performance of a company or of a country. And, when, and so they sort of gather data on how a company is doing on climate change, on carbon emissions, on pollution, on resource efficiency, on biodiversity. Then they are getting data on the social performance that goes from human rights to community relations to human capital. and then corporate governance, corruption, rule of law, institutional strength and transparency, right? So lots and lots of different uh, indicators and of performance on these three uh, metrics. And you think this is great, right? We need this level of granularity. We need to be able to work out how good a company is in its behavior towards the environment. Do you have uh, oil spills? If, if you do, you should have a low uh, score on E. Are you following labor standards or do you oppress your workers? Uh, is your CEO engaged in sexual harassment? If that's the case, then you will get a low score on, on governance. And this is great, but because it is provided by private companies, the private companies are providing uh, ESG data and they transform this ESG data into, into a metric. There are many ways in which you can do ESG, but I'm going to focus on the one that involves data. Then you come, some really amazing things happen, which is uh, uh, even more amazing to some extent that credit rating agencies. Is that depending who your provider is, you might have a very high score or a very low score, right? So what this graph is showing you here, there are two different raters, MSCI, which is quite important, and then FTSE, and uh, if you're here, oh, I can't move away from the microphone, but you, you will see that there are various blue dots that, are very, that have a very high score on the MSC ESG rating and a very low score on FTSE and the other way around, right? So if you, are a co if you are a financial institution whose regulator is telling them you have to hold ESG, you have to hold companies in your portfolio with an ESG rating above 50, you will go to the private provider that gives you a number above 50, right? Which in some ways it's nice for private finance, but it, it also creates a lot of space for greenwashing. Okay? And this is recognized, if you read central bank speeches, Mark Carney gave a speech a couple of weeks ago, it is recognized that ESG ratings are very subjective and they, are, they produce conflicting results. In other words, the rules of the game as they are now are allowing private finance to call green whatever they want. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit. There are some checks and balances, but, but the, the multiplicity of providers of ESG ratings raise some important questions. And I wanted to show you that your institutional investors here in Germany are starting to play the ESG G game. Here is, remember, MEAG. Um, I have no idea what the MEAG stands for, so I'm sorry, I cannot translate. But it has recently argued that it's going to integrate ESG in, in, in its uh, uh, investment uh, practices, uh, and it's going to integrate the ESG that is provided by the people at the bottom in, in, in blue uh, by, from MSCI. Right? So German institutional investors are embracing the, the ESG agenda. And why is this a, a problem besides um, uh, the conflictive ratings? 
is we have lots and lots of evidence that ESG ratings are basically allowing companies to, and, and particularly private financial institutions like BlackRock or private institutional investors, they're allowing them to claim climate change credentials while in practice actually obstructing the move to a low, uh, low carbon economy. They are allowed to game the system while preventing a, 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 a structural uh, readjustment of the system. And here I'm showing MSCI that MEAG is uh, working with. And they, they have an ESG index for index investment. And the top 10 constituents of this ESG index are Microsoft, Apple, Amazon, Nestle, uh, Procter & Gamble, Johnson & Johnson, Alphabet, and JP Morgan Chase and company. And we know JP Morgan Chase has been financing fossil fuels over the last three years to a tune quite unprecedented, right? So this is MSCI telling us that if you, that their green uh, uh, or, or high ESG uh, standards uh, can be derived from JP Morgan and Chase. Mm -hmm. To my mind, it's, it, it is, it demonstrates the, the, the very significant problems that we have and the very significant potential for greenwashing. The same story with BlackRock. BlackRock is providing many different types of ESG uh, uh, investments. But when we look at what BlackRock does as a shareholder, BlackRock is so big that it's basically a majority shareholder in lots of different companies. And we know very recently that at a shareholder meeting, BlackRock prevented uh, measures that would allow more accountability of CEO, CEOs of high fossil, of fossil fuel companies. Uh, I, so there is, to my mind, a lot of greenwashing that is uh, um, potentially a lot of greenwashing through uh, ESG, the ESG system, but it, that is the status quo that we have now. Okay. We could have a different system uh, of, of thinking through green and, and brown, and that is the EU taxonomy. Uh, the European Commission has been working on it for a couple of years now. It has a TLAG, a, a technical expert group, that has decided that it will create an, a taxonomy that doesn't rate companies on environment, social, and governance performance, but it says, I will take every economic activity that I can think of, and there are some debates there or what these are and how should they should go in, and I will look whether these economic activities are making substantive progre progress on one of these environmental objectives. And they can go from climate change mitigation to adaptation to protection of health ecosystems. So if an activity is making a substantive contribution to one of these objectives and is doing no significant harm on the other five, it is taxonomy eligible. In other words, it is fitting or it is green. If you're taxonomy eligible, you're green. And this is how they will apply it to uh, an equity portfolio. They will. Uh, so you can compute what is the proportion of company revenue or turnover that is green, right? That is taxonomy eligible. And from there, you can come up with a green equity fund that is 54% taxonomy eligible. I mean, this is a random number that they came up with. But just to illustrate that they have found a way, I'm going fast again. They have, they have found a pretty complex, but I think not too bad way of creating a public taxonomy that's, that distinguishes between green and non-green assets. Uh, unfortunately, and this is my attempt, I have done this with Google Translate, uh, unfortunately, the taxonomy has met with a lot of resistance. Uh, it was supposed to come into uh, force next year. It's now been delayed. Uh, we know that most uh, um, Euro, Euro system central banks are supporting it. Here is somebody from the Bundesbank saying that this is a, a great first step in the second paragraph. Oh, you're welcome to help me translate it. <laughs> Maybe I should use the translators. But what we see, uh, one of the institutional invest investors from Union Investment, remember in the table of institutional investors, they don't like the taxonomy. And the reason they don't like the taxonomy, they are arguing, it's because the taxonomy only rates the greenness of a financial instrument, but it doesn't say anything about social and governance issues. And you see how the framing here is very important because who doesn't care about social and governance issues? Or should you leave them on the side? The problem is that once you create this binary opposition between ESG and the EU taxonomy, then obviously you, can, you will uh, push for uh, the ESG system. And once you have the ESG system, the possibilities of greenwashing are uh, significant. And this is even more significant, not only because there are shareholders or, or pension, uh, uh, individual citizens like you and I who say, OK, I want my pension fund to go green. And, I would like, and my pension fund says, I will go green. And here is my list of ESG investments. 
but because regulators are catching up on the need to have a stronger position on regulating uh, finance and reorienting finance. So the, 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 the uh, discussion now is moving into what do we do about climate? Okay, and I want to talk a little bit about the climate uh, policy agenda. And this from the last week's meetings of the IMF and the World Bank, Christina Georgieva, she was on a panel uh, with uh, several central bankers, including Philip Lane from the ECB. And she said there are two, there are some controversial issues and some non-controversial issues in the climate debates. And the non-controversial issues are that companies and financial institutions should, should disclose their climate risk exposures and that central banks should stress test banks for climate risks. In other words, it is within the mandate of the central bank, within the financial stability mandate, to work out uh, whether uh, you, we are getting a systemic crisis from climate risk exposures. The controversial issues, and here is where the politics is going to kick in, is what is the right taxonomy for disclosure? In other words, do you go for ESG or do you go for the EU taxonomy? For in Europe, right? This EU taxonomy may, may become a, a universal taxonomy, but for uh, this is the only significant public taxonomy we have. We have a Chinese one, but that is not has not been used outside China. So you have this is one controversial issue. How do you disclose if you, uh, uh, your climate exposures? How do we know what is green and what is not green? And then whether central banks can proactively use their tools to penalize brown investments. So that is the next step. Once, regu once everybody can work out what is green and not, what is not green on portfolios of institutional investors, what do we do about it? Do we penalize brown investments or do we not penalize brown investments? <clears throat> and central banks matter here very significantly. And we know this from a speech last year by Benoit Couré. I would advise you to read it. It's, it's surprisingly easy to read for uh, somebody who's not that deeply involved in um, uh, monetary policy discussions, but he argued that it is within the mandate of a central bank to actively support the transition to a low carbon economy. See, the central banks have already adopted this language of, uh, of a transition to a low carbon economy. And the first one is to define the rules of the game. And this is the debate about taxonomy. And second, to act accordingly without prejudice to price stability. And of course, everybody asks, what it, does it mean to act accordingly? But part of acting accordingly may mean penalizing brown assets. And private finance is resisting the penalizing of brown assets because it means you have to accept a lot of, uh, potentially a lot of stranded assets, or you have to accept uh, significant losses in, in profits on some part of your uh, balance sheet. Okay. So how would, if, if, if Benakure and if central banks were really serious about this, what would it look like? It would mean that you have to pr price climate risks uh, properly in the way in the ECB loans to the commercial banking system. In other words, the kind of collateral that you accept, that is the kind of financial uh, instruments that you accept uh, from commercial banks in order to lend to them, would matter a lot and it would discriminate between brown and green assets. And at the moment it doesn't, and because it doesn't, it effectively encourages and subsidizing brown assets and it encourages uh, lending to brown activities. You can also introduce climate calibrated capital rules. And again, there you'd say uh, your loans to Shell are going to have a, a much higher capital requirement, which immediately means uh, lending to Shell will be much more expensive for the private banking system. However, within the Wall Street consensus, the push is against penalizing Brown. And the logic is you shouldn't penalize Brown because it creates systemic risks. And with the, the, the systemic risk logic is central banks are saying there is something called transition risks we have to worry about. And these transition risks are the risks that come from stronger regulatory agendas of, of private finance. In other words, if tomorrow I say all Brown assets will be twice more expensive to finance the ECB, then uh, some of these brown assets might uh, be sold by commercial banks immediately in the market. This would create a, a fire sales and it will create a systemic crisis. So we can't do it. We shouldn't, we shouldn't accelerate transition risks. And therefore, we should just stay with a safer option of subsidizing green. And of course, this is a very nice scenario for private finance because with an ESG framework, green does, it's not this but green means anything almost you can think of. I mean, I'm exaggerating, but you can, you can put a lot under green and then you can get the state to subsidize uh, 
your green assets one way or another, either directly through the central bank or in some ways through the regulatory framework. And that is the game of, or the, the way in which private finance is trying to play the climate change agenda at the central banks by pushing very hard against the transition risks. Yes. Hi. Um, I wonder if you, you may be getting to this later, but um, if you could unpack a little bit about the collateral framework. I know this is your area, another area of expertise, of course. Um, and, and also get a sense of how important such measures could be, in your opinion, relative to other measures, um, you know, Green New Deal and so on. Mm. Okay. Uh, you have to thank Nick for uh, this uh, deep introduction into the technicalities of collateral frameworks. Uh, very quickly, so a collateral framework uh, of the central bank uh, establishes uh, how much funding a commercial bank can get by giving an asset as a collateral to the ECB. The best example of why this collateral framework is so important is Greece, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm sort of go, taking you to the next week's conversation, but. Uh, before 2008, uh, if you were a German bank, you could give Greek sovereign bonds to the ECB or to whatever the Euro system, whatever the Bank of Greece, whichever Euro system bank. You could give Greek government bonds or you could give German government bonds and you would get the same amount of financing in, in, in loans from the ECB. When the crisis came and the credit ratings changed, right, in the same way that ESG ratings would change, then giving ECB Greek government bonds to get loans became far more expensive than giving German bonds, right? So the, 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 the worse the collateral or the, loan, the securities that a bank has to give to the ECB, the less funding it gets for it. Oh, I don't know how our, how our translators are doing uh, for a variety of reasons, but that's a way for the ECB to give a signal to private financial markets that it likes these assets and it doesn't like these assets, right? And if you're telling uh, private finance, I don't like Greek assets, and I don't like Greek, uh, I, my, my expression of I don't like Greek securities is I'm going to have a high, high haircut on them, then obviously private finance is also not going to like those Greek assets that, that much. And is going to say, well, in order to borrow against these Greek assets, I will ask for more margin or I will make it more expensive. So that's a very powerful way it's not very e easily understood because you, you see, I have to go through five minutes of talking to explain what is the collateral framework, but that's a very powerful way for the central bank to give both indirect and direct signals about what it thinks in terms of the credit quality of a particular financial instrument. And if it did the same, what the ECB did to Greek assets, if it did the same to corporate bonds issued by, by Volkswagen, let's take Volkswagen because it's an interesting case of uh, ESG behavior, and incidentally, before the Volkswagen scandal, Volkswagen, I heard, had a higher ESG rating than Tesla, which tells you something about the, the ESG framework. Uh, if the ECB says, I, uh, if you want to borrow from me against uh, Volkswagen corporate bonds, it will be far more expensive than to borrow against, I don't know, a very nice small car company or an electric car company, then that price signal will go into the market and Volkswagen will have more difficulties borrowing. Right, so it's a, I think it's a very powerful way to reprice financial assets in the, in the system, and that's why central banks are pretty reluctant to do it. Although they will accept, in sort of the different settings, they will accept that their decisions about what is a, a high quality asset and what is a not, not a high quality asset matter a lot for the financing conditions of the respective companies. Okay, so I think it's a powerful instrument. I'm happy if you disagree with me. I haven't seen if, if it wasn't that powerful a framework, then probably the ECB would have, would have done it already. So that's where we are at the moment uh, in terms of the Wall Street consensus. The idea is to, to deal with transition risks, you just have to subsidize green. And if you can extend the boundaries of what green means, and you can do that a lot with the ESG framework, then uh, that's fine. Okay, so I would argue that, that in some ways, Wall Street consensus is a form of subsidized greenwashing. Then this is what we're looking at, and this is what worries me. Not because I think that uh, subsidizing particular financial instruments is per se problematic or not. I mean, my political position is yes, but because it opens up a new sort of common wisdom about how do we fight climate change that is absolutely inconsistent with the urgency of addressing the climate crisis. And that's what is at stake here is we have banks and, and shadow banks, institutional investors, who are 
have so far made the rules of the game in terms of identifying what is, is green and what is brown. The state will subsidize green financial products by, for example, giving a, a preferential treatment to green assets in the collateral framework or by, gi by giving a pre uh, preferential treatment in the uh, regulatory framework. And fiscal policies will stay within um, carbon price but not go forward. And why does this matter? This is my picture of trying to keep you entertained. It's because the Wall Street consensus is basically in a sort of a enshrining and is, has a logic of fiscal discipline hardwired that is, to my mind, inconsistent with a, a green a zero agenda or with a, making a rapid transition to a low carbon uh, economy. I'm not saying that making a rapid transition to a low carbon economy is easy. It's very difficult. But it certainly will not happen if we remain committed to uh, the Schwarze Null or to a, a vision of the state that doesn't do very much in order to accelerate the transition besides saying, ah, your ESG framework is great, and yes, I will give you some, some subsidies. Okay. Now, what is the alternative? Uh, how do we finance or how do we green finance in order to uh, uh, um, meet the Paris targets? I think. One has to bear in mind that it's important, carbon price is not enough, and it's not enough for a variety of reasons, including for the fact that the, the global price of carbon is super low and the political willingness to increase the global carbon uh, price is almost inexistent. What we need, uh, and, and is desirable, and what I would fight for as a citizen in the street and as, a, as an advisor in my um, expert capacity, is first we need to recognize that without greening private finance, we will not get to where we want to get in terms of the climate change agenda. That is because institutional investors are sitting on a lot of money, and if we allow them to continue to finance brown activities, then they will continue to... Uh, uh, um, finance brown activities. So that means a public taxonomy, uh, uh, the European Commission should for once be supported in its efforts to push forward despite the resistance, including from uh, your country, uh, against the taxonomy, and it should come with a mandatory disclosure. We should know who holds what and, and how green and ungreen that is. We should also use the taxonomy in order to green banking and to, to green the ECB. That's very important. Not only is private banking brown uh, to, to, a certain, to a significant extent, but the ECB in the fact that it does not discriminate between green and brown um, financial instruments is basically subsidizing brown. And that there are ma many ways in which one can do that. I don't want to spend too much time, but if you want in the question and answer session, we want. We can, and, and what we need more than that, we need a Green New Deal. And a Green New Deal means goodbye, Schwarz and Null. It means a big state that has a big balance sheet and that it takes on its balance sheet the transition risks. In other words, if the German auto industry needs to shrink because it is high fossil fuel, then somebody needs to think, and I think only the state can deal with the social uh, consequences of that. Only the state can create the kind of uh, green industrial policies that are going to make sure that this is a just transition, that it does not penalize um, workers and it does not and, and rewards institutional investors. And you would say, well, why wouldn't we reward institutional investors? After all, I am part of the institutional investment world because I have a pension fund. No, I am a privileged academic in, in the UK. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not benefiting much from the institutional investor uh, turn as well because my pension is shrinking every year and, and our pension rights are getting lost. So we are not ultimately the beneficiaries. This is an agenda that only works for, I would say, the 1% or the 0.5%. So what we need is, to my mind, a much stronger state in terms of its willingness to deal with the very serious question of transition risks. We, this is not a costless effort. Greening your economy will hurt lots of different industries and lots of different workers in lots of very complicated ways. And if the state, st state stays out, we get the Chile scenario. I don't know if you're following what is happening in Chile now. I have very many close friends who are Chilean. And they, they are a, kind of an interesting example of a Wall Street consensus uh, political uh, um, uh, setup where almost all their social services are privatized. And this is part of the Wall Street agenda. You saw there in the clip. The idea is privatize your social services through public-private partnerships, make institutional investors finance them, it will be fine. 
Unfortunately, what this creates is very nice returns for institutional investors and for the owners of capital and a very miserable life for, for uh, regular human beings. And when they are fed up with it, they will go out in the street and they will start burning things because the structural violence of, of this kind of a system is very difficult to take on a day-to-day -day basis. So we need a bigger state that does green industrial policy and that is coordinating between fiscal and monetary policy. And that, this is something that's very difficult to discuss in the European Union. The, the question of, or in the Eurozone, coordinating between monetary and fiscal policy means that somehow Frankfurt has to stop complaining about what the ECB is doing. And that is a very tall order, but uh, that is the kind of order that we need to have in order to uh, deal with the, the uh, transition risks from uh, 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 moving towards a low-carbon economy. There are lots of things that can be done there. I was told not to throw uh, acronyms at you, so I'm not. Uh, OMT stands for Outright Monetary Transactions. I think every German should know this name because the Germany opposed them for a very long time with very serious consequences for uh, the European um, Social Pact. Uh, but the, the central bank can buy green, financial instruments, he can support them, but he shouldn't do so if he doesn't penalize Brown, because then it becomes a, 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 a program of uh, subsidizing private finance in order to protect it from the climate crisis. I would prefer citizens to be protected first uh, and, then, um, and then worry about uh, institutional investors. There are all sorts of other sort of discursive and ideational shifts that need to happen. In other words, we need to change the way in which we think about the macroeconomy and the institutions of the state. And that's a, a very tall order, but I think the urgency of the climate crisis will, requi will require us to do that. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you. All right, questions, comments? Yes. Um, a kind of typical question, I guess. Um, how, have you thought about how to translate these concepts, <clears throat> such as brown haircuts, onto something that would turn up on a protesters' black hole. Mm. How do you, how do you um, talk about central banking and how do you talk about you know, the repo market and things like that um, in this context? Mm. Sorry, I know that's a difficult one. Well, I'm hoping maybe this audience can help me work through that. I mean, I think this is a, a difficulty that, that protest movements in, in neoliberalism have, that you have to translate very technocratic issues into very political ones. And, and I'm, I've tried to do that here. Uh, I would say ECD subsidizes coal. Uh, ECD subsidizes fossil fuels. Um, how does it do that? This, is the kind, this kind of conversation, in a sense, is the kind of conversation that you would have with your Green Party, uh, whatever local um, unit, as opposed to out in the street. But, but I think looking at, for example, at the, at the financial transactions tax debates that we had, I don't know if you recall that in 2011, 2012, for some uh, very interesting political reasons, we were in a moment where Germany and France said together we should tax finance, right? Which is very different from this story. And we should tax particularly the kind of finance that I'm describing here, the one that is trading on a daily basis, that it, it's making profits out of speculative positions. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons why this was for quite a while a successful campaign and it pushed the German and, and French policymakers to, to put a weight behind it was the fact that civil society organizations ended up at the table with, um, uh, with their politicians, but with also with uh, uh, finance lobbies in Brussels. And my experience of that was that what was really difficult for private finance lobbies, and I did a couple of interview, interviews with people in, in private finance that lost their temper during the interview, which was very interesting. I'm aware I'm, I'm on YouTube now, so I'm not going to name them. But the fact that civil society organizations were at the table discussing questions of finance in um, really irritated them because they said, why don't they worry about poverty and, and gender inequality? Why are they talking about finance? They don't know what they're talking about. And of course they knew what they're talking about. Finance is not so complicated. Okay, maybe I, I made it sound very complicated, but uh, you know, this is a 30 minute talk. Uh, but finance is not that complicated. And once you acquire the language, I think, and you can get into the rooms where decisions are being made, you, you can become a real force 
at least for pushing politicians in some direction, right? So I would not mobilize on the haircut uh, framework of the ECB, but I would certainly mobilize on the taxonomy because the taxonomy is fundamental to the way in which we will reorganize the financial system over the next 20 to 30 years. And, and that is, I mean, how do you translate the question of what is green and what is brown into a political movement? Uh, I'm not quite sure. I'm an academic uh, with very limited experience of politics, but that is something that needs to, to be on the agenda. And I'm trying to convince everybody that I talk to who is in a political party that they should go to Brussels and they, they shouldn't let private finance debate with the European Commission what are, what are the, the activities that fall under the taxonomy. In the same way, the Germany shouldn't say natural gas should be in the taxonomy. It's not now in there. So this is, you have, I mean, this is a difficulty that I'm not sure how to solve, but you, you probably have uh, better insights than me. But th these are the real political issues that are being discussed. And if we stay at the level of, uh, I don't know, poverty, uh, it's, it's comfortable for private finance that we do not engage with this kind of, uh, of a discourse and with these kind of concepts. I don't know what the answer to this is. I think I, think I would prefer, uh, this is something that I tell my friends who are, who are doing post-structuralism and studying Derrida and Foucault. This is easier than Foucault. I, mean, I try to read Foucault. <laughs> uh, it's much easier, but people prefer to read Foucault. I do not know why. This, this is what affects the day-to-day -day life. Foucault as well. I have great respect for Foucault. But if people can read Derrida and Foucault, they, they can certainly read this. So I'm not entirely convinced that, that dumping down is the strategy. Maybe, I don't know, dumping up, I guess, uh, is, is a better way to go. But what, what stage do you think we're at in terms of mobilization of civil society on these, quite, where do you feel we are on these quite technical issues? Because, I, I mean, looking at the sort of the campaigns against tax havens, which, you know, I'm being involved in myself, uh, it started with just a few kind of radicals saying, making some quite complicated arguments, but at the end of the day, they were quite simple at their heart. And slowly, you know, um, new constituencies came on board. So, the, you know, development mm. aid NGOs came on board, and then mm. unions got involved, and, and different groups realised that this kind of affected mm. them. How, how how far have we got on that process of getting people involved in these issues? Yeah. Are we just at the beginning of something that we're going to get huge flowering? I would I would imagine we other people want to know that. And what do you see out there? You know, mm. Is Greenpeace talking about this stuff? Mm. Not that I'm aware of, but I, I think first calling it something that is catchy is helpful. And I'm trying to do, th do that with calling it the Wall Street consensus, because for most people, Wall Street means Wall Street. And the Wall Street consensus means that somehow private finance is going to deliver on the, on the climate goals. And I think 10 years after the global financial crisis, there must be some doses of skepticism in saying that. So calling it the Wall Street consensus is helpful. Uh, for example, I took has picked it up last week, and they are they are going to embrace this as a concept to try to push back against uh, what the World Bank and the IMF are doing. Uh, but we are at the beginning, and 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 in a sense. I mean, I see part of my work of doing activist acad academia, because this is what I'm doing to a certain extent tonight and in other spaces. It's activist academia is to say these issues matter and you should focus on them. Not many organizations are focusing on it because it, it kind of strands the two worlds of finance and environment and most environment people that I meet, but maybe I haven't met the, the relevant ones, uh, are still focused on, on the real side, right? On what do we do with our productive processes. And I'm telling them that private finance is a, a very important part of the puzzle. And if you don't work there, you're not going to be successful here. Um, so I guess we are in the beginnings. And maybe there should be, and I'm sure with time and with people with experience, uh, there will be a translation of these complicated issues into something simpler. Because for sure, it needs to be simpler than this. But yeah, it's a, it's a, my worry is that we will end up working out the concepts after the, 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 the rules of the game have been set. And it's very difficult to change the rules of the game after they have been established. How long have we got until the rules of the game have been set? What, uh, we still have time. We still have a couple of years because the European Commission is debating this. And because central banks are under very significant pressure. And there is a very interesting thing going on there because central banks, I mean, I've seen them in, in very different spaces working through what is a paradox of financialized capitalism that we live in now, it's because 
the, the political system is not wired at the moment to deal with the, the kind of crisis that we have now. We really need West, Western capitalism as it functions now needs to be completely restructured. To do that, you need political systems where there is enough recognition of this needs radical change in the way that we think about our, our politics, in the way that we think about the coalitions. And I don't see that now. I mean, we are all looking outside uh, Germany, at uh, Germany, because the Greens are <clears throat> growing so fast here. And, and there is, a, I think, a historical responsibility for the Green Party here to kind of show the rest of Europe what is possible to do. And I'm not quite sure that the Green Party is there yet uh, in terms of the, the, the thinking about what, what is the politics of the compromises and the politics of the coalitions that need to be done. But it, it's important. And Harry Boll is working on this. And I guess they are closer to politics in many ways than, than other foundations. And, and they have a sense that, that, that questions that are super technical should be politicized. This is a very political issue. That it's not on the radar is very different from, from saying that it shouldn't be. And I think it will start being on the radar. I don't, I, I'm really curious of what kind of political coalitions are possible in civil society organizations to start fighting on this. And the answers are not entirely easy because uh, you really have to sometimes fight against trade unions or to bring trade unions on board. And you, I don't think you can build trade, bring trade unions on board unless you're willing to tell them, we will take care of you. The, the logic of the Wall Street consensus is that it will de-risk a, a climate for private finance. And the politic, we need political consensus that says we will de-risk climate for citizens. And de-risking climate for citizens means you have to have a big state that is basically going back to some logic of the welfare state. Remember, the welfare state de-risked capitalism for its, its citizens. We now need a, a new kind of, and the new Green Deal does that. It, it, it has a sort of new welfare state logic or a green welfare state logic where it de-risks uh, capitalism for climate. Yeah. Yes. But just a question, wouldn't it be much e uh, easier to reduce the power of this uh, private financing sector and all those huge banks and shadow banks uh, with, the in, uh, with the property tax and just take this money that's there and it's so much and uh, and not try to influence and make new rules for this absolutely um, like imbalanced situation we have now. So just take the money from them and make the state uh, powerful again. I would do this, it's much easier. <laughs> I, I don't know which political system you live in, but I want to go there with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we have to go together because it's yes. a democracy. I mean, I'm, I'm trying to vote in this direction. Okay, so who do you voting, vote for? Who do you and, vote for to get this? doesn't like uh, really uh, because I never voted for a huge uh, uh, private equity sector, mm -hmm. and uh, so for me, this situation we face now is not democratic at all, and we have to uh, take back our power as because we are like we are the power. I, I live in this. Uh, I live in this belief. I'm sorry to tell you that. No, no, I, I, I completely understand. I also live in the belief of we are the power. Unfortunately, we are not very powerful at being the power, which is a problem. And I will <laughs> never go in this, uh, like, uh, accept this uh, uh, taxonomy and try to, to like, uh, like, I'm not so naive to think that, uh, that I really can change those rules because they make up those rules. Mm. And just, I'm not stupid enough to think I could change anything with this. We have to, uh, I think we have to think and act differently. I, I, two hours ago, I was playing your role with some green party people. So yes, <laughs> I agree. But I think the, I mean, if you can find a party that says I'm going to nationalize all pension funds uh, and I'm going to nationalize all insurance companies and I'm going to take all liabilities of pension funds and insurance companies on the balance sheet of the state and we'll be fine, then yes, this is a great solution. A property tax is not enough. I mean, not even a, fi a financial transaction tax two years after the global financial crisis was passed into law for a variety of reasons that have to do also, also with Germany and your uh, chancellor, uh, sorry, your um, minister of fi uh, finance at the time. So yes, I mean, there are simpler solutions. You could say uh, destroy financial capitalism, obviously, <laughs> but uh, this is not the solution. I mean, on it, I, I would say this as somebody who studied this for a very long time, unless we get a very serious crisis, we will not, you, you can't just do this and financial capitalism will disappear. I mean, are you willing to go out in the street and then uh, take 
the kind of measures that will convince the state that it is important to nationalize pension funds? The, you, these things need politi concerted political action that sometimes goes into violence, and I, I don't see people wanting that. So yes, this is a more, let's, I don't think it's a technocratic, but it's, it's not even incremental political solution. It's pretty radical in some of the things that it suggests, but the alternative that we somehow will get a revolution, I, I don't see it. I mean, I'm happy to join it if there is one, but uh, I don't see it anywhere. Let's take another question. Back there. Um, I will try to uh, turn my what to uh, express my question in English. Eh? My English is not. So if you want to do it in German, I'll translate it quickly. Uh, okay, but I will. I will try to Good. do it. Huh? Um, I am asking myself uh, in all of those ideas about managing uh, financial uh, investment and. Uh, a new taxonomy uh, about uh, financial activities, where do I see that there is included uh, a part of uh, the science, uh, the investigation, uh, the climate uh, experts, mm -hmm. uh, which are included in uh, those decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, that is something lacking for my understanding in all those movements uh, which are claiming for climate change. Mm -hmm. We are concentrating only about uh, reducing CO2. Mm -hmm. That's very important. But I think uh, the, the, the question is uh, much more uh, broader mm -hmm. in terms of uh, if we do uh, have the same structure of products we are uh, producing worldwide or uh, our kind of living is included too and that has to be recognized in all those transformations I think and uh, I don't see it in the Green Party, I don't see it in the climate uh, movement and I think uh, in relation to revolution one of the big problems in revolution <coughs> is that we make a revolution without any concept and we are going to that. Mm. And we are going to the Barbary, or how is it called? Barbary. Mm -hmm. um, with, because we are not working even in the basis mm. yeah, to understand mm. what really is necessary and how to implement it, how to, how is it called, fall on uh, demand. To demand it in uh, movements. Mm. The working movement has always had an idea and very concrete demands in their uh, big uh, trade union uh, 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 movements. Mm. And uh, we don't have. Mm. And I think we have to talk uh, much more about that than, uh, because that would change also the financial sector. Okay, so I will say in response a couple of things. Uh, first, it's, I mean, I don't, don't want to defend the taxonomy. I find myself in a very strange position defending the European Commission because that's not what I usually do. But the taxonomy is designed by technical experts, right? It is people who have identified whatever, what levels of carbon emissions are consistent with whatever climate mitigation level. And and there is the, the environmental movement. I don't know how it is here in Germany, but in the UK, the environmental movement has a very clear target of net zero by 2030, net zero carbon emissions, which means that somehow you need to change the way in which you consume and in which you produce in order to reduce your level of carbon emissions. And, and some people are saying net zero by 2030 is nearly impossible because that's 10 years from now and because we don't have the institutional structures in place. But, but I think, uh, to my mind, the, the environmental movements do have, uh, I think they do have the science behind and they do have the objectives that they can show to politicians. And in the UK, we used to have net zero by 2050, and now the Labour Party has voted to move it to 2030, even with trade unions present there, which is quite an ambitious thing. Now, the questions of how do we organize revolutions, I mean, if you, and, and let me give you an answer of the kind of solutions that are coming from the Wall Street consensus. I was last week in Washington for the IMF World Bank meetings, and there was a panel 
called uh, putting a, a financial value on Wales. Wales, right? Everybody understands Wales? Have we lost our translators? The Wales is the big... Yeah? Wild fish. Uh -huh, yes. Okay, so the logic was that uh, they have discovered... So one of the... the I haven't touched a lot on, on it, but there is this uh, very comforting narrative, again within the Wall Street consensus, that says, okay, maybe we can continue with our lifestyles and with our productive structures as we have, but we need better climate mitigation strategies. That is, we need to find sinks or, or systems that are sucking carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so we can continue consuming the way we used to. And whales turn out to be a, th a magic thing that is absorbing amazing amounts of ca carbon dioxide. So now the IMF is saying, if you put a proper price on whales, you will stimulate the growth of whales and whales will solve everything. And I think, okay, excuse me for being skeptical, uh, <laughs> the, the whales are not going to solve the climate crisis, but this is what we're looking at. And there is, there is quite a, a, a growing literature that looks at this idea of climate change mitigation as another financialization instrument, because it's not that we, the, the question is, if you want to have a large forest that you're going to protect where is this forest going to be located? How are you going to displace indigenous communities if they are there? What are you going to do about them? So the, the sort of imbalances and political economy questions about the relationship between the global north and the global south are not that clear to me. But I don't think that there is no science behind the, the climate change agenda. And in terms of barbaric things, uh, I, I also, uh, until I got converted to the climate crisis agenda, I, I kind of decided to ignore some of the things that are going on, but if I look now at how this capitalism works, if you look at Brazil or if you look at Ecuador, it is a very barbaric system what we have now. This is, this is a system that is abusing nature, that is abusing indigenous communities. In Ecuador, people are going out in the street to protest because the IMF has given them a loan uh, and the, the Ecuadorian government said, we're taking a loan from the IMF to improve uh, poor people's livelihoods. It turns out that they will use the loan to pay Chevron, who has won a, pri a, a case in a private court in The Hague uh, against indigenous communities in Ecuador who had, that had sued them in the first place for polluting uh, a, a natural park. So this is where we are now. This is, a, this is a barbaric system on many, many ways because it is systemically violent towards the climate and it's systemically violent towards poor communities. Do we not want a, I mean, I want a revolution. I just, I'm not sure with whom and how, uh, but I'm very clear that this system is, is huh, together. together. <laughs> well, you know, if we spend another hour in this room, you will see that we're very different. <laughs> uh, and, and what uh, we might not be able to create it together so easily, but yes. Any question here? Yes. Um, Can I just, yes, yes, yeah. go. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. Yes, go. I just wanted to ask about uh, a bit about the politics of central banking and, and how political pressure that you're describing, the mechanism by which it will affect decisions made by central bankers, given the independence of central banks that you mentioned at the very beginning. Um, how, yeah, how, how does that work? Or is it that central bankers make these decisions autonomously, in which case it's not really about political pressure? Can, can this sort of happen in a technocratic way entirely? Can the sort of discussions happen among the banking, the bankers, uh, uh, for making these decisions? And I think this is a difficult uh, question to resolve in the sense that, I mean, central bankers are, are in a very difficult position because on the one hand, they would really like to kick this ball back into the, into, into the political arena and to say fiscal policy has, has to deal with it. And they've said this for the last five years because we're obviously living in very complicated times where you don't get a lot of growth. Uh, but at the same time, they are recognizing that it is within their mandate for financial stability to take care of, of climate change. So you have competing pressures that are going on and, and their answer so far is, okay, we will just create more, we will bring transparency to risks and we will keep it there, but transparency is not enough. And the next political step is to say, okay, uh, we need to do something more substantive, which is to take measures to, to impose regulations that change uh, the allocation or whatever, that penalize certain assets and reward others. And the politics there is difficult. For example, I know if you look at France, France has been a bit ahead of um, 
of the UK. The UK Central Bank is supposed to be the one that is most sort of progressive there. Mark Carney, when he talked about the tragedy of the horizons and about climate change, he got a lot of criticism from private finance. Now he looks like a visionary, but I think it is, it is something that they cannot run away from. And, and there is this ball kicking from the political to the, from the fiscal to the monetary back and forth. Uh, but ultimately, I think central banks will just have to accept that they are, they are not apolitical institutions, one, and second, that this is within their mandate. And now they're saying it's within their mandate. And just to clarify, I mean, the critique would be that this is not a democratic decision-making process mm. because they're making this decision on their own. And, and should we just be okay with that? Like, in other words, should we accept this is not a democratic process? This is a, a technocratic process, mm. and we, we, that's, it, that's okay. I would prefer that you, you were a, a democratic process. And, and a democratic process would mean that the central bank sits down. I mean, there are institutional ar arrangements under which this can happen. Whereas where you have, for example, mm -hmm. France has a high, it's called a high climate council, which is supposed to coordinate between the central bank and, and politicians. And that's where your democratic processes come in. The problem is uh, that do we have time to wait for the political process, the democratic processes to kick in? And what do we need to do in order for the democratic processes to kick in? I would be very happy if central bankers would say tomorrow, we are going to penalize some brown assets, uh, even if it's a technocratic decision and uh, I, we, they aren't sub subjected to the kind of democratic scrutiny that they should be there. I, I don't think that we should rely on central banks to solve the problem. But this is what happens when you in, in financial capitalism, you create a, a hierarchy of uh, macroeconomic institutions and you concentrate political power in the central bank. That is very clear to me. And now this is what we have. Unless we change this, then it's up to them. Hmm. Uh, my question uh, directly relates to this one, uh, because I wonder if member states who are often themselves big holders of uh, brown assets, like for example, the Polish state is, mm -hmm. holds large part of the Polish coal fleet, which as well is very uh, significant for the uh, talks about strengthening uh, EU emission reduction goals mm -hmm. for 2030. So could, can they influence this uh, yeah, negotiation process? Could the Polish state put in their political power to defer these um, activities to penalize brown assets and could the, can member states they have, do they have how much power do they have to I mean they do in the sense that this is like a typical European Union process, right? Where you have an initiative of the Commission that is the taxonomy that will become a law uh, for uh, if it's approved by the European Parliament and then it has to be approved by the European Council. And my sense was that not only it's now, I mean, it's, it's gone to the European, well, I mean, the new European Parliament has to come in, but, but countries do have veto power in the European Council. Uh, and I have no doubts that Poland will be very tempted to exercise its veto powers, but I also understand that Germany was, wants to exercise its veto powers. So this is where the question of democratic politics kicks in, because in some ways, the, it's, it's very difficult to work out how how to deal with the trade-offs that individual member states are facing without taking seriously a very big Green New Deal. And I think this is why the Commission has come up with, up with this idea, because there is a, a recognition, uh, in, in the Commission at least, that the kind of structure, the kind of political trade-offs that we are looking at cannot be solved without big investment. And if but you know, I don't know if you follow the scandal of the EIB. EIB was supposed to, the European Investment Bank was supposed to be at the forefront of this, and now it's not going to be because uh, you know member states have very diff different political uh, priorities. I guess that's where the pressure from below comes in in terms of pushing for for I don't know a European budget and and European Green New Deal where Polish workers get compensated. But that's the politics of this is super complicated. I thought only Polish workers would have to be compensated as well. The Polish state, right? I mean, yeah. their assets would be devalued. Mm. And like in Germany, there as well a lot of coal assets which are held by German municipalities. Like mm. Our our WE is in large part uh, held by German uh, cities. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. But I think if there is one institution that can take losses on their uh, fossil fuel holdings, is the state. Yeah, yeah. The state has something magic that private 
companies don't have or private institutions don't have, which is that they usually have a central bank and they have the ability to create new assets through taxation. And I'm not worried about that. Why they're worried about that is, a, is an important question. But in theory, uh, if we're talking about who takes losses here, they should be taking losses first uh, before whatever private finance or, or individual households in Berlin. Mm. Question behind him. Yes. Uh, I want to hear your opinion on uh, if this green financing can actually, like, what is the, uh, is the speed of this transition actually fast enough? Because I'm thinking, well, okay, well, so we are like, uh, we're making that the, the opportunities for a green investment more, like, uh, attractive, but still, I mean, on the other side, we also need, like, projects which can be financed. And, mm -hmm. like, if there's, like, a lack of green projects, like, what, how do we, address this problem? Mm. Well, I mean, it, the, the question of what to invest in is not easy. Uh, I think you're right. Uh, and uh, at least the logic of, of penalizing brown assets and, and, and promoting green assets is that you reduce the cost of capital, so you encourage capitalism to do its thing on the ground, right? Uh, whether this can, I, I personally don't think that it will be enough. I mean, it, it can help, but I think the, the question of the state comes back in here. And we were talking today about uh, the difficulties uh, that Berlin had in terms of uh, capping rents, because with a climate uh, program, as I understand it, but please correct me, uh, the, the idea of creating, of, I don't know, creating energy efficiency in households uh, means that you have to allow for some rent increases. So, private owners can invest, right? And um, I was wondering, I had a conversation with some people uh, who are close to the Green Party, and I was wondering, why isn't the German state borrowing and install installing solar panels and doing uh, insulation of every household or every house and flat in, in Berlin? What, what stops them? That's a way of creating green jobs uh, and creating green projects that you can invest in one way or another, and it can, they can be financed very easily with German government bonds who are negative yielding. I mean, there is no other country in the universe that can afford to do this more than Germany can. can. And, and so I'm, I, I'm not convinced that the argument that there is nothing to do or, or that we don't have enough green projects is true. I think we need to rethink how the, we put the state in. And uh, if you look at the, the history of the Green New Deal in the US in the 1930s, or if you think now here, uh, you know, people can become uh, experts in installing solar panels in 20 days if you pay them well. So I, I, don't, I don't doubt that there is capacity to reorient uh, sort of some of the work workforce towards green activities. Uh, you just have to be willing to work through the, how is a Volkswagen highly paid worker going to move on to a rooftop to install solar panels. It's not an easy question, but that's what we're looking at. Um, I think. Question here. Um, so, are, are we uh, missing the elephant in the room uh, in, in the sense that what climate change actually means? So, climate change will probably mean uh, climate migration, whether mm. that's um, um, within uh, a nation state or uh, uh, cross border migration, because um, it's probable that um, market forces will lead to a green transition anyway, because oil is no longer. Uh, easy and cheap to extract, and therefore uh, solar and wind energy has only become very uh, attractable. And uh, for example, China has um, created new technologies where you have long distance uh, electricity transmission, uh, which uh, where, where the loss rate is far lower than, than previously. However, um, if you have um, cross-border migration, or even within a uh, migration, even within the nation, then we have huge logistical problems, like where are those people going to be housed? And there, I don't believe the market uh, will come in. The market will come in too late, because um, you know, if people are only there and housing isn't there, then it's a huge problem. Uh, this is where we need government uh, or, 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 or trans-governmental um, uh, influence. Mm. But as I see it, um, I predict that democracies will increasingly become uh, more and more dysfunctional uh, for the simple reason of how our uh, technological uh, algorithms are working. 
So the way it works right now in your own, own social media platforms is uh, if you like A, then uh, you will like B, and if you like B, you will definitely like C, where C is closer to B than B is closer, uh, cl close to A. And what that does, it pushes people into these echo chambers, and it's very difficult to create political consensus. Mm. I know in Germany, the, uh, the issue of, uh, you know, the Green Party is very successful, but in other countries, it's not like that. The United States is um, one prime example where, you know, the Republican Party is completely off the scale uh, when it comes to uh, the, the climate. Uh, issue and one reason is of how these um, um, algorithms are are functioning yeah. and therefore um, just just my like, last point therefore would we actually need non um, non uh, democratic institutions like um, the European Investment Bank and the ECB to act in these cases for example with the Green New Deal. Mm. Yes, I, I, I mean, my, one of my worries then is that if we don't get a sort of progressive Green New Deal, we can get a, an authoritarian right-wing Green New Deal that is going to say, I am going to protect some, of my citi some citizens from uh, the climate crisis and I'm going to disregard every, everybody else. So to me, the scenario is not a lot more migration, but it's a lot more fortress Europe or not even Fortress Europe, Fortress Germany, and Fortress whatever, Holland, and I'm, I don't know, Holland is probably not a good example because uh, it's going to lose a lot of land to, to the sea. Uh, so yes, I, I mean, wh whether, whether algorithms and AI and uh, sort of what they call surveillance capitalism comes in there, it comes in there in some ways, uh, but I, I, for one, am convinced that you cannot wait for the market to reorient uh, energy consumption towards, uh, I don't know, renewable energies. That is simply not enough. Uh, if, if we want to go back to lowering those CO2 levels towards the, like historical averages. And, and migration, I mean, we are looking at the increasingly authoritarian societies, and I think the right is embracing them, slowly the climate change agenda, for arguing on, on about a, you know, a very authoritarian uh, states. And this is what we're looking at. We will get a big state one way or another. I would prefer that we don't get an authoritarian state that is, um, has historical experiences uh, of functioning in very damaging ways. That, that would be my answer. I, I, I think not that we'll, let, how, we'll, how we'll let migrants in, we won't. No, no, no. I, no, I, no, I want to. I want to have the conversation. Uh, sorry, uh, because housing, uh, housing due to migration will be very important because many scientists believe that we're already too late. So if you if you if you look at the um, more realistic, uh, mm. less um, less hopeful uh, research, it shows that we're already too late. So even if we do everything that we that we can possibly do now, climate change is still going to happen. Mm. So we need to be concentrating on migration. The UN panel on migration, climate migration, has only just been set up. And I think we're I mean, doing what, yeah. we, what, what human beings are always doing, doing. We're, we're acting too late. We're... I mean, I feel like I'm in Germany, so I don't have to explain to you the, the, the re migrant uh, crisis and, and the responses that Germany has and, and my admiration for, for Merkel for that reason, not for many others, but, but that. But also there are very serious limits to that. I mean, you can say, okay, maybe a, a, a Green New Deal with a progressive state would say, okay, there aren't enough Germans who want to put solar panels on, on Berlin houses. We can get people from developing countries who are running away from, from very serious climate events. But this is not what is going to happen. I mean, my, my worry is not that we cannot construct houses for migrants. My worry is that we will not ma let migrants in the first place in because the, the logic will be we have very limited resources, uh, we have very serious climate threats, uh, keep people who don't look like me outside. I, I'm, I'm, the UN has done a lot more on migration, I think, than, than you suggest, and this is an ongoing issue, but uh, I, I don't even want to, today we, we had a, a scandal in the UK because they discovered a lorry with 30 bodies dead inside. I mean, that is the climate, I mean, I, that is a, a, a migration issue. I don't know how, I don't know the details, so I don't know how they were related to climate, but you are looking at a very positive scenario, I would say. I'm looking at, a, I'm thinking of a much more negative scenario where lots of people are going to die in, in front of, in the seas, in front of Greece and in front of Italy. And we will take our uh, naval 
whatever weapons and keep people out, as we do now. I mean, we do that already. Well, that is an unofficial European policy at the moment. There you go. So I, I don't think the question is how will we house the migrants? The question is how will us not be migrants? Because, uh, you know, migrant uh, is, can become a very complex category in many ways. And uh, I might be a migrant on, on, a, on many different levels for an authoritarian state and they will kick me out. Uh, so, yeah, I would be worried about the other way, go, the people getting chucked out of authoritarian states in, in very kind of historically evocative ways. Mm. I feel like I'm letting you all down. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, as the colleague says here, I think there were some more questions in the back. There was the colleague says here, we can always organize and, and stop this from happening. <laughs> no? Yeah? We have a question. I wonder if um, putting emphasis on changing of financial, financial system um, shifts responsibilities from um, the changes in individual consumption patterns. So what's your take on that, do you think? So if I go out in the streets and say, look, I went to this great uh, talk the other day, and I heard that it's not about our individual behavior, it's more about the, the you know, huge picture, the financial system, mm -hmm. and the, those things, it actually doesn't really matter how you, how you lead your life and uh, which consumption decisions you take. So what do you... What do you... Mm. I think that's a difficult question to, to address because, I mean, if we understand the climate crisis as a, consequence, as a structural consequence of capitalism, which I think, to my mind, this is what it is. It is the way in which we organize uh, economic activity in a particular political system. Then clearly we need structural solutions that doesn't absolve us from individual responsibilities. I do not know what the limits of these individual responsibilities are because I flew to Washington last week and I flew to Berlin to, uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, does this make me a hypocrite? On some level, yes, uh, it does. Uh, at the same time, uh, would, I, would I prefer more structural solutions? Yes. I think going to the, in the, in the individual responsibility road is, is a very complicated avenue because then you start to compute what each one of us is doing in order to have some absolutely marginal effect on, on the climate crisis, right? So I say, okay, I don't have children. Uh, people who don't have children, uh, or even if they take a transatlantic flight once a month for every month for 30 years, they are still going to have a lower carbon footprint than people who have children. How, how do you cope with this argument? Uh, I don't know. There are people who are not having children anymore. Uh, no, seriously, there is a movement in the U.S. where people say, I, I am responsible for the climate crisis. I will stop reproducing. Uh, do I get brownie points because I did not have children? I don't know. But I don't think that this is the logic that I want to operate with, uh, of the individual responsibility, because this is a structural issue. And I am not benefiting from this structural issue. And I would prefer that we have structural solutions. On the other hand, when you're discussing with people, you might not be that too much into the topic, <coughs> then it's so much easier to change their consumption patterns instead of changing the financial system. Which means um, experience um, future possible tra transformation towards a more sustainable way of life mm. um, is experienceable for them. Is what exists. Um, I heard you have like a Friday for motor engines movement in Germany. So I don't know how it easy it is to change people's minds. Uh, I see men in big mean cars with a, a lot of uh, horsepower <laughs> going around. I, I personally think, OK, uh, even, even if we changed in some small ways, we need to have such radical changes of individual behavior that are not possible within the next 10 years, right? Because you have to give up almost everything, your mobile phone, even if you give up everything that the, and, and only walked, went on a bike and, and uh, I don't know, had your own allotment, I have an allotment, I have a bike, I don't have a car. Well, there you go. Right? We, go we can go down a list, check of things. It still would, it still would not solve the structural situation and the structural features of capitalism that are producing now the climate crisis. So I'm thinking, how many people would you need to convince and to change what if you can't get enough people to vote for the Green Party who promises to deliver structural solutions? I, I'm not a, I, I think individual responsibility is important. I don't think that is where we should be going. I think it's part of the solution, but the, 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 the fight is taking on the structural forces. But I don't know how many people here think that, or you think maybe individual solutions are 
I mean, I, I don't know, I probably should not be talking because individually I clearly am not delivering. Uh, um, yeah. Yes? Um, yeah, so uh, like on various points that have been raised, um, I mean, I totally agree with what you just said that like individual, the change of behavior, I mean, it's just, well, A, not enough, and B, like for, for a lot of things, there's just no alternatives right now, right? So, I mean, if you live here in Berlin and you don't want to travel around a lot, it's kind of easy maybe to reduce your own emissions, but if you live in the countryside, I mean, what, if there's no public plan for instance, like, what are you going to do? So, I think. Coming back to sort of the structure of your talk a bit, um, really what we need to do is like mobilize for the second option that we need to restructure the um, relationship between the the state and markets and how we conceive the role of the state. Um, and I was going to ask like about so I do like your first okay, I do like the approach like sort of the open approach that you have towards the public taxonomy and um, but then going back to the beginning of your talk. You kind of told the story, okay, so we had financial capitalism and it failed in the crisis and now it's trying to kind of capture uh, mm -hmm. this green movement and create a new um, sort of tool of financialization and we should oppose that. But then like if <clears throat> we don't orient all our energy towards this second um, uh, avenue, then like how successful are we going to be? So in the beginning you made it look like there's two alternatives where how to go. And in the end, you were saying, okay, we can kind of remarry them and we should support also the public. I mean, I would say it's important, but then, like, communication wise, it's maybe really the most crucial thing to mobilize for the second. Mm. And, and also because, I mean, now, yeah, private finance is very important, but like, if we are going to have a Green New Deal, um, then there's a lot of factors that will make it less important. I mean, we have to regulate finance, we have to tax wealth, and we have to. Um, um, and we have to sort of rebuild the welfare state because like you were saying with the unions and the workers, I mean, if we don't de-risk climate change for people, like you were saying, then there's not going to be a majority for this. And if we take away, like say, pension money again from the financial sector, then there's a lot less institutional investors. I'm not saying it's easy and we should wait <clears throat> like for a revolution to have it happen all at once, but I think like the political discourse really should be like Sanders and others are doing that we need to kind of like have the avenue that we go on to the right here. Mm. Yeah, yes, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I am kind of marrying a little bit the two at the, at the end. And I think in some ways, thinking through it like, um, I mean, it reminds me of Margaret Thatcher's strategy of getting rid of the trade unions was to kind of create Trojan horses in order to reduce the power of the trade union. So not only direct fight, but you know, sort of little increments here and there. And, and honestly, I, I think in some ways a taxonomy is part, could be a Trojan horse for shrinking finance, because if you have a proper taxonomy, they, it has to shrink. There is no way around it because it, it is invested in so many fossil fuel assets. So that, that goes to the questions of, of politics and, and, and the political interests and the political arrangements that we have and private finance is very powerful. And, and if we think, I, I don't think that you can have a Green New Deal and private finance uh, in the way that it operates now uh, is just inconsistent uh, because the Green New Deal is completely reorganizing the political terrain. Uh, and we can look at the experience of the Green New Deal in the 1930s and I think it was possible for Roosevelt to do what he did because immediately after the global finance, after the Great Depression, he repressed finance. I mean, institutional investors were very important in the 19, early 1910s and 1920s, and when the, glo the cr crash came, he just regulated everybody out of existence. Uh, and maybe that's what we need to do. Uh, it's not very easy to do, but I think it has to be a, 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 a political effort on both fronts. Because if you don't have it on that front, then I worry that we will create green new deals for private finance. And you can read that in, in, in private finance uh, letters to the European Commission on the taxonomy. For example, they are saying, what about justice for the global south? Your taxonomy is going to make poor people in, in, in poor countries even worse. And I'm thinking, why does private finance really care about the global south now? <laughs> uh, because they haven't before. And then it started, I'm starting to think that they are embracing and now everybody, like if you listen, I, I listen to, to private finance people talking 
all the time. And now they are talking about the Green New Deal. And this worries me. When private finance is adopting a term that used to be something that democratic socialists in the US used in order to gain political visibility, then I'm thinking, what is going on? And it, it is, the Green New Deal could become like a, a, some post-structuralists, I want to bring back my post-structuralist side, they used to call them empty signifiers. It's becoming an empty signifier. You can put anything in it there. And now the justice, the, a just Green New Deal might mean justice for institutional investors. How do you not fight this? This is also something that one has to keep in mind, that, that we, we don't operate in a political vacuum where a Green New Deal will flourish. We operate in a political system where private finance is very powerful. And we have to fight that. With a, maybe not with a taxonomy as a Trojan horse, but uh, in some other way. Thank you.